Welcome to Lecture 22, Part B. I'm Dr. King Owen. We're going to continue our look at the Roaring Twenties. The subject matter of this lecture will focus mostly on the social history of the 1920s, whereas Part A was on economic political history. Let's begin. One of the key stories of the 1920s socially has to be what happens in the lives of women. Um, it's a promising era that launches, of course, with the 19th Amendment, 1920. But it's also an era in which getting the right to vote does not necessarily translate into dramatic changes politically for women. And in fact, the new roles that women are going to play are going to reflect a divide between urban and rural values. Urban women wanting to push forward in new ways that were certainly not like those of their mothers. And rural women wanting to continue in Protestant Christian uh, behaviors that made, of course, in their minds, America great. Women, by and large, did not vote as much as you might expect, having won the right to vote. At best, probably a turnout somewhere was in the neighborhood of 46%, but on average, is about 35% of women actually voted when they had the right to vote. So clearly, uh, winning this particular right did not automatically translate into new behavior. Women continued to work. Um, and worked in greater numbers in the 1920s. Uh, the progressive era haven't opened up a lot of opportunities for women thanks to expansion of educational opportunities. And of course, in the 1920s, women wanting to participate in the consumer culture of that era are gonna have to get a job to pay for it. I think a key indication of the limits of a feminism and new roles for the women would be the rejection of an Equal Rights Amendment in 1923, uh, proposing that women and men be recognized uh, equally under the laws in the Constitution. This, of course, uh, was just too much for um, the 1920s to accept, too much of a shift in roles. And we could even point to when it returns in the, the 70s, it's still too much because an Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution still has not passed. And in fact, um, we could point to another rejection of some of the progressive era values. The Supreme Court struck down a minimum wage law for women. And you could frame this in lots of different ways. Um, the progressives in many of their uh, legal cases had argued for protection of women, the state looking after women because women as mothers needed to be able to like raise good children. That's for the benefit of society as a whole. Um, you could look at the striking down of a minimum wage law as um, anti-progressive in the sense that we're no longer protecting women uh, by guaranteeing a particular wage for them. You could also look at it as women being able to say that they could push for wages um, on their own, sort of uh, as whatever they could negotiate. Uh, typically of the Gilded Age, that argument uh, known as the freedom of contract. So you could see this in lots of different ways. Um, I tend to read it as a backing away from the progressive era protections for women and sort of a retreat from the ways in which the state is going to look after women. We also see a decline in the reproductive rate in the 1920s, thanks to the spread of contraceptive knowledge, a large part by campaigns by Margaret Sanger who was arrested for her publishing and spread of knowledge of how to prevent pregnancy. Um, as a progressive, uh, Sanger, of course, shared progressive ideas. Uh, she came at the issue of 
pregnancy is an issue of one, women being trapped and hobbled by their lack of ability to control their own birth cycles. Um, and she did not want to see women saddled with unwanted children. The state, of course, looked at this as uh, you're meddling in the natural order, God's laws, and so uh, definitely not legal for her to share this knowledge. And it won't be constitutionally protected as legal until 1963. Women, however, spread the knowledge anyway, and flappers in particular take this information to make a revolution sexually so that Saturdays are not just for the boys, they're also for the girls. A lot of what women are capable of doing as flappers is to go out and enjoy a social life on relative equality with men doing what men do. If men smoke, women are going to smoke. If they drink, women are going to drink. If they are engaged in a romantic entanglement with a man that they aren't married to, well, men do it, so it's just as okay for girls to do it. All dancing to the soundtrack of jazz, which provided the sinful beat um, that led to so much eroticism and so much uh, sketched behavior, as one a, a push student once wrote. So this is indeed an era in which women are not pushing political and economic limits so much as they are pushing social limits. Um, they are embracing a new vision of themselves, showing legs, showing arm, cutting their hair, Actresses like Clara Bow adver advertising her dangerous curves, uh, much to, of course, um, entice men and cause them to wreck the automobile of love. It was indeed an era in which women are rejecting their mother's vision of morality, and they are flouting gender norms and, of course, rejecting prohibition as well. Illustrations of the flapper showed her typically uh, dancing with her shorter um, hemlines, showing some leg and arm. Uh, she can have some hooch with her main squeeze. She can cut a rug with anybody, just like any guy can do with her short hair. It's indeed a brave new world for the women of the era. So by day, you go work on the switchboards. Um, notice this lovely short hair and this wave, dressed pretty nicely. It's a pretty, pretty dress here, a row of pearls. But then at night, you can go out and party with the boys. Short hair, of course, made that easy. And the costume of the flapper girl, in many ways, was meant to imitate a man's clothing. Short hair made it easier, of course, um, to navigate social life without having long hair in the way. So bob your hair, the song suggested. Margaret Sanger pictured here, very much looking a lot like a flapper. Um, advertised the idea that women be educated so that they could regulate and control their own reproductive affairs. That, of course, landed her in hot water with the state, and she was arrested um, at one point for publicizing this knowledge. Of course, these behaviors are not going to sit well with a lot of traditional Americans who look at the changes of the 1920s and say, what has happened to the America of our mothers and our fathers when we had values and morals? Fundamentalist preachers rejected the new modern age of sex and sin. They called for a literal reading of the Bible so that we would return to the faith of our fathers 
that we would not embrace alcohol and sexuality of the 20s. We would not push gender boundaries. We would not worship celebrities like the two movie stars pictured here who with their sultry looks were seducing audiences across the United States. And indeed, this actor here, when he died of appendicitis, spurred a wave of suicides by love-stricken girls who were heartbroken that their heartthrob could no longer grace the screens with his male beauty. Fundamentalist preachers called for Americans to reject this sin, this sensationalism, this selfishness, and their values of returning to the good old time faith were reflected in a particularly interesting trial that took place in 1926 in Tennessee, the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial. It was um, a fight between urban and rural values over the teaching of evolution. Biology teacher John T. Scopes taught about evolution and Darwin's theory, and of course was hauled before a court and prosecuted for undermining the word of God with this new modern science. This trial led many to ridicule Tennessee as promoting backwards anti-modern values and ignorance. But the fundamentalists said that they were standing for the word of God, standing firm in the faith, and they were not going to let Americans slide into the abyss of sin and evolution. Fiction writers, meanwhile, criticized this urban-rural conflict for its shallowness, for its fakeness, for its conformity, and for its materialism. The faith of the 1920s in the eyes of these fiction writers was hollow. Even the fundamentalist preachers themselves, according to these fiction writers, were not genuine, were not authentic. Writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Sinclair Lewis mocked Americans in The Great Gatsby and Babbitt for their sinfulness, for their conformity, for their love of business, for their hometown values that were stiflingly conformist and really lacking in authenticity and engagement in the real problems of modern life. Prohibition, of course, uh, was one of the easiest uh, parts of American life to ridicule since hardly anyone followed it. Um, it was the ultimate expression of rural values being imposed upon Americans, thou shalt not drink. And of course, Americans collectively went, <coughs> whatever, we're going to drink anyway, even if we have to make it at home in our own bathtubs and of course, if you uh, had the right amount of money and knew the right person, you could pay off politicians and get along just fine with your hooch. Prohibition, in fact, led to a mockery of rural Americans uh, attempt to impose their values upon America. And it also led to a rise of organized crime. So thanks to prohibition, we see the rise of gangsters like Al Capone and others dominating urban environments and supplying plenty of illicit booze, but also violence as they engage in turf wars with their rivals. Was prohibition actually effective in controlling America's alcohol problem? The evidence seemed to suggest no. In fact, um, habitual drunkards increase under prohibition in this data collected in Philadelphia. Um, initially, drunkenness declines um, as prohibition goes into effect, but within three years of its effective date, um, drunkenness increases 
and then dramatically increases as Americans not only drink, but now, of course, they're getting arrested in mass numbers for breaking the law. One of the areas in which the 1920s really pushed boundaries, much to the anger of rural fundamentalist Bible-believing Americans, was in gender. Women adopting the looks that made them look more like men seemed to confuse Americans, as this cover for life implies, what's the essential difference in bathing costumes between the man and the woman. They have similar haircuts, similar outfits. You know, who's who? Um, even men dressed um, a lot like women and the male equivalent to a flapper, uh, a man who engages in flapperish behavior, was known as a jelly bean in the 1920s. This song, We Men Must, Mo Must Grow a Mustache, was intended to poke fun at these gender-bending conventions of the 1920s to say that if men want to distinguish themselves from women, they're going to have to do it with facial hair. This song also ridiculed the inability of Americans to figure out who's who and follow the gender conventions that they had so been long used to. Um, the song, Masculine Women, and masculine women, Feminine Men, Which is the rooster, which is the hen? It's hard to tell them apart today and say, Sister's busy, learn and shave. Brother just loves his permanent wave. It's hard to tell them apart today. Hey, hey, girls were girls and boys were boys when I was a tot. Now we don't know who is who or even what's what. Knickers and trousers baggy and wide. Nobody knows who's walking inside. Those masculine women and feminine men. This is a popular song of the 20s to point to these ways in which people are pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable socially. Fundamentalist preachers did not stick to their pulpits and their literal reading of the Bible. Some of them even adopted 1920s values in order to promote their message, and none was more successful, at least early on, than Amy Semple McPherson, who sort of adopted the, the, the look of a flapper, but while preaching hometown Christian values from her church that uh, was described by one attendee as supernatural whoopee. She's shown here um, in her church services in which people are emotionally connected to what's going on. Um, it was an exciting and dramatic experience that was broadcast over radio. Her church services featured pageants, choirs, um, all kinds of elaborate stage productions. On top of the church was a giant rotating electric cross. So Jesus is big business and certainly entertainment in Amy Semple McPherson's world. The Scopes Monkey Trial, of course, attracted a lot of Americans' attention. And um, you can see here from this picture that the fundamentalists involved are thinking that this is really a conflict about the future of American youth. If we teach evolution, if we teach Darwin, if we teach biology, that's going to send children to hell. Probably didn't look good for Mr. Scopes when the trial started with a prayer. It was Tennessee, after all. There is Mr. John T. Scopes. Cartoonists ridiculed Tennessee as promoting ignorance, encouraging children not to think, 
by banning them from reading material about evolution and Darwinian theory. A songwriter, of course, had a little bit of fun with this song. We're in a revolution, just over revolution. The battle of ages is on. Some scientists have claimed we're human just by name, that monkey monkeys and men are the same. But Darwin's theory doesn't sound good to me. I might have monkey manners, but with him I can't agree. You can't make a monkey of me. You can't make a monkey of me. There's not a monkey in my family tree. I searched on each branch from Adam to me. I am inclined to believe the story of Adam and Eve. There's no chimpanzee in my pedigree, and you can't make a monkey of me. In the social world for African Americans, the story of the 20s is a search for freedom. It is one not unlike the search for women that involve breaking norms, shattering expectations, and taking to the cities. The Great Migration, which began in the pre-World War I era and accelerated during World War I, found many Southern African Americans seeking new homes in the North where they could escape racism and segregation. During World War I, they were attracted by the promise of jobs. They stayed in northern cities in low-paying occupations, where at least they weren't in the South. Northern African Americans had to debate their place in American society because they discovered that Northerners were no less racist than Southerners. And two voices emerged in the 20s, projecting different opinions on how Americans should think. One voice was Marcus Garvey, who led the Universal Negro Improvement Association between 1917 and 1923, advocating that black Americans should return to Africa. He rejected integration and argued that African Americans were better off separate from whites. He saw no future in, when, in which black Americans had a common interest to integrate with white Americans. So he encouraged a return to Africa and a support for a pan-African vision where Africans could join together to promote black unity in the mother country. He was arrested and then eventually deported to Jamaica, which ended his uh, influence in the United States directly, but his name and his message lived on through people who had worked for him and then later showed up in such people as Malcolm X, whose parents worked for Garvey. The other leading voice was, of course, William Edward Burghardt Du Bois, whom we've talked about before who advocated uh, black Americans fighting for equality and integrating into American society, because after all, they were born here in the United States, they built America, they deserved freedom, they deserved everything about um, the American experience, and they shouldn't accept anything less. This was a vision that was particularly strong in Harlem. Um, a area of New York that had originally been settled um, by Jews in the late 19th century and then gradually became about 90% African American um, by the 1920s. This Harlem Renaissance saw uh, an outpouring of music and literary talent to showcase pride in black culture. The Renaissance um, essentially looked at uh, black Americans with an eye of, you built the US, you should have pride in your history, pride in your culture, you should embrace who you are as African Americans, 
you are, in the words of one book, the new Negro. You are not that old African-American who's got your head down, who's trying to avoid, you know, racism and trying to avoid getting called out and just hanging your head and accepting it. You've got your head held high. You are fighting for integration and you are proud of who you are. Marcus Garvey loved to dress in military regalia, of course, psychologically speaking, it draws attention to you, it elevates your status. Um, his black star line uh, preached um, African Americans guiding their own destiny, investing in people like them in Africa. Um, so he called for a, a vision of pan-Africanism, Negroes awake, as he says in this pamphlet here. Uh, but, of course, that aroused the anger of the United States government, who arrested him for mail fraud and deported him. Part of the Harlem Renaissance was a tremendous outpouring of poetic and literary thought, such as um, writer Claude McKay, who wrote this poem in 1919, um, the year of lots of race riots, If We Must Die, and this has always been one of my favorite poems about African Americans saying, if we're in a situation where we have to fight for our rights, at least we are going to die with dignity. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow, what though before us lies the open grave. Like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall dying, but fighting back. Another of my favorites is Gwendolyn Bennett's To a Dark Girl. So bringing an eye of the Harlem Renaissance pride in African-American history, but from the lens of an African-American woman. I love you for your brownness and the rounded darkness of your breast. I love you for the breaking sadness in your voice and shadows where your wayward eyelids rest. Something of old forgotten queens lurks in the lithe abandon of your walk, and something of the shackled slave sobs in the rhythm of your talk. O oh, little brown girl, born for sorrow's mate, keep all you have of queenliness, forgetting that you were once slave, and let your full lips laugh at fate. And to bring together a lot of the threads of the 1920s, I want to talk briefly about Gladys Bentley, a remarkable figure of the Harlem Renaissance era, who not only um, embraced her musical love for jazz, um, the soundtrack of the 20s, um, embraced her um, African American heritage, but also push gender boundaries as well as sexuality boundaries. Bennett was born in 1907 um, in Philadelphia and remarked later that she always felt that she was born different. Um, she thought she felt wrong in girls clothing and preferred to dress in boys clothing. Um, so she went to Harlem and became a performer with a, with a lot of lesbian themes um, in her performances. She openly flirted with women um, during her performances as a blues singer and pianist. She employed drag queens in her shows. 
She often sang in ways to mock high class culture in very risque songs. And throughout the 20s, she was a staple of the Harlem nightlife. Um, the Great Depression, of course, uh, really did a number on her career and forced her to move. Later in life, she tried to rehabilitate her image um, and, and rejected this lesbian history that she had um, had in the past, married a man, um, and then contracted um, an illness and died in 1960. For a brief moment, Bentley, in the words of Langston Hughes, was an amazing exhibition of musical energy, a large, dark, masculine lady whose feet pounded the floor while her fingers pounded the keyboard. A perfect piece of African sculpture animated by her own rhythm. The epicenter of Harlem nightlife was the Cotton Club, where the um, African-American members of the orchestra played the jazz and blues tunes that were the soundtrack of the era. The Cotton Club actually catered to white audiences who came to see this musical culture played by African-Americans as they were served by lighter skinned girls. And therefore, um, at the time, many of these white audiences were seen as sort of pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable um, in this world. And of course, their money kept the Cotton Club open. Here's the nightclub map of Harlem, so you can see where to go, whether it's over here to Cotton Club and Cab Calloway's band, or down here near Gladys's Clam House, where Gladys Bentley wears a tuxedo and a high hat and tickles the ivories. You can even go up here and get some marijuana cigarettes from the reefer man and stop over at Tilly's for fried chicken. It's really good. African-Americans from the South create the soul food culture of the North. Um, and so they dramatically reshape the food ways of Harlem in ways that um, if you travel to Harlem today, you can still enjoy. So that's been our look at the social history of the 1920s, the themes of freedom for women um, and African-Americans pushing the boundaries of what is socially acceptable as the 20s roar to the soundtrack of sin, angering rural conservatives who wanted to call Americans back to a fundamentalist view of good old biblical values. America changed and would not return and be the same, no matter how hard those Bible-thumping rural folks wanted.